Hello friends, welcome to another episode of Archaeologists in Quarantine. Today I'm joined by special guests, 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 Benoit Robitai and Bed and Aaron Detta Wolf. I completely muddled that up. I apologize. I feel like I should do it again. Let me do it again. <laughs> We're live, as you know, on YouTube, so you know how it goes. But for later on when I do my editing, it will look it was it will look and sound amazing. Okay. Yep, so no again problem. we have <laughs> ben, ben Robitai and Aaron Detta Wolf, who are the creators of Archaeology Inc., which is on Instagram and Facebook. Hello, guys. Thank you both for joining me. Hello. How are you both? Fine. Doing Thank well, you. you know, middle of pandemic winter, but, uh, you know, muddling through, right? Definitely. <laughs> it was minus 30 so, this morning. Minus 30? Minus 30. Uh, I can't live in that. <laughs> no, <Me> absolutely <laughs> not. I can just about survive with like minus three, minus four. It's that's really cold for me. I mean, I'm in London, London, UK, so um, I can't survive in the cold. I mean, I love it, but no. I'm, uh, I'm here in Nashville, Tennessee, and it's like the dead heart of Southern winter in the United States, which means it's you know, a balmy 32 degrees Fahrenheit and like everybody is freaking out and putting salt everywhere and has 52 <laughs> layers of clothes on. And, you know, we won't let our children outside because they might get the frostbite. <laughs> it's, just, it's a little silly. It's... Wow, amazing. Um, what I should say before we actually start the, the actual, you know, the nitty gritty of why we're all here today, a few disclaimers. One is that we will be showing human remains mummified, tattooed limbs, but just a disclaimer that you may see that. So if you're a bit squeamish, um, this might not be for you, <laughs> um, but it's really interesting. And from a special scientific point of view, it's really fascinating. And uh, some of you may notice I am adorned in uh, something archeologically as well. So <laughs> we will not be speaking about this that much unless there are questions from the public, then that's a different story. <laughs> But um, I just wanted to say that, okay? So again, we will have human remains. Now that's out the way, that's all good. I think the first question is, what both, what, why did you both get into archeology span and specialize in tattoos? I mean, it's very niche and it's awesome, but, but what got you into it? <laughs> it? It is pretty niche. I'd actually love to hear Ben's origin story. I've never heard the whole thing. Um, I, I was going to let you go first, but I'll give you my origin story. Um, I, um, I, at, by the age of 17, I was quite convinced I would never step into a school again in my life. Quite happy and content in that thought. But um, I spent many winters in Central America, got interested in, in, uh, in, in you know, the language and the people and um, my brother convinced me that I should perhaps try to go to university and study anthropology. And I was very interested in ethnology. I didn't connect well with the teachers and I thought the archeologists were a lot more interesting. And uh, I kind of shifted into archeology span and uh, thought I would be like many of us uh, from our generation, a, a Mayanist, one of the hundreds of Mayanists. And uh, at the end of my bachelor's studies, I, um, I bifurcated towards tattooing because I did a paper and found interesting things and, and, and felt it was worth pursuing. And it was a nice kind of um, solitary place to be at the time, 25 years ago. Um, you know, it felt a lot um, more airy than the world of Mayanism or Maya studies, which is very crowded and competitive and bustling and uh and i've been at it ever since wow nice but i actually am a failed mayanist as well so uh so we have that in common i went to a uh, graduate school to study my archaeology and um also realized during that period that there were you know a great number of people who were far more qualified to have phds and hold university jobs than i was and uh, so transitioned into doing uh, contract archaeology, CRM work here in the United States, and was sort of at the right place and the right time when a state level job opened up here in Tennessee. 
And so since 2007, I've been the prehistoric archeologist for the state of Tennessee. And I got interested in the tattooing question via that research, right? This kind of underlying question of if we know that specifically for my research, ancient Native Americans, but more broadly, people are all around the world were tattooing in the past, then why aren't archeologists finding those, the artifacts of that practice? And so that sort of fired the right way with me and sort of pushed me down a rabbit hole, which pushed me down another rabbit hole. And, you know, what, eight, 10 years later, here we are. Um, and Ben and I met at one point, I had, I had just recently published the, uh, the volume Drawing with Great Needles, which is on uh, ancient Native American tattoo traditions. And uh, Lars Krutak, who had contributed to that book, suggested that I reach out to Ben. I was doing some other research on tool types and Lars was like, hey, you should contact this guy, Ben. He knows more about tool types than anybody else. And I emailed Ben and just sort of cold called him, right? And got this very polite email back from him in which he told me everything that I had done wrong in the book and, <laughs> and all, of the, all the mistakes I had made. And, uh, and it was very polite. It was also like 100% accurate. You know, like all of the things that he pointed out were, you know, sources that I had missed or hadn't found or, you know, additional steps that I hadn't thought through. And, and so I was like, I need to talk to this guy more and I need to drag him into contributing <laughs> to, to papers and to books and to things like this. And so back in 2014 was the first time we worked together on a paper talking about the differences between technologies in Native American tattooing practices and scratching practices, um, which is you know sort of a, a light scarification tradition that happens, and how you know you can't just interchange those artifacts. You can't just kind of wave your hands at at sharp artifacts and say, well, these were used for tattooing or scarification or scratching or piercing, right? It kind of piles on top of itself. And our point going into that, and I think has been a lot of our research since then as well, is that you know, that's not the case, right? Specific artifacts work for specific purposes and they're oftentimes not multifunctional. And so, you know, when we look at the archeological record we got to take these other things into account when we interpret it. Hmm. It's the thing, I mean, we are interpreting it and especially something like tattooing when it comes to the tools. I mean, we'll get into that a bit later, um, but when we're looking at the tools, how we interpret that from the get-go of finding it, I think we probably most of the time misinterpret it. And I know, I'm, I'm sure we'll get into that uh, later on because it's very fascinating. And it does start to make me wonder in general, when we find material in the archeological context, do we get it right? Yeah. Are we getting it right? And Ben has said something, I think this is your, your quote, Ben, that you said, you know, a flat blade screwdriver is the perfect tool to open a paint can, but if you interpret it archeologically as being a paint can opener, then you're totally missing what it was actually created and used for by the people who created it and used it. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think that's from me. Are you sure? That you. sounds like your kind of wisdom. We'll, we'll attribute it to you, okay? I, I, have, I, have, I have similar ones, you know, going through my head, but it, you're right, you know, we had, we had a teacher who would always say that, did you see someone use this as an arrowhead? You know, when you find an arrowhead. And, and I remember looking through, you know, things on, on Native American material culture from, from the turn of the last century and seeing things that indeed looked like, absolutely like arrowheads, but were hafted in wooden handles and seemed to have been pocket knives or something. So, yeah. And, you know, I think we'll, we'll get back into this a little bit later, but... Um, you know, that being really strict about identifying tattooing instruments, it's, I mean, it's just good practice, first of all, but also it, it prevents a problem which we run into often in our subdiscipline, and it's probably a problem all over the place in the sciences, is that once it's decided that something is a tattooing instrument, over time, it just gets put in that black box, you know, and then it, it becomes an unquestioned interpretation that that like kind of fossilizes into a fact or a truth and and you know that that just sets um, weak foundations for moving forward mm. and I, just for our, I, sorry ben i was gonna say just for our viewers could you explain what you mean by the term black box 
because Aaron explained it to me earlier, but I'd never heard of this expression before. <sighs> you know, I, I should have read up on the... the, the, the... I could take a stab at it. You want me to? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, yeah. So, So like for hard sciences, right? So it's this idea that you become so fixated on the outcome of a process that you lose sight of the components that generate that outcome. Right, so the, the black box is everything that happens to generate the outcome, but the outcome is so successful that everybody forgets about, you know, the bells and whistles and gears and processes that went into inventing the things that live in that black box now. And so, you know, for tattooing, for example, one example, uh, one idea might be, um, you know, a medieval historian who says very definitively and authoritatively that, you know, the ancient uh, Britons tattooed with iron objects. And that becomes a thing that is regarded as fact and is passed down then both in, in secondary literature and on Wikipedia and online is just, just being fact. And when you step back far enough, you can start breaking down that black box, like what goes into that identification. Um, the person who said that may have lived centuries after the culture that they were talking about. Um, with ethnographers, they may never have visited the culture that they were talking about. You know, what are the biases of the recorder, of the person who's doing the interpreting? All of this sort of gets into that, that question of, you know, how do we know what we know? Well, how do we know what we know? Yeah, well, <laughs> I think the fancy word for that is epistemology. That's the one. And, and it's an epistemological problem, you know, that, that, that we have when we, we stop questioning our, the basic assumptions on which we build the rest of our thoughts, reflections, hypothesis, theories. It's so a I mean, lot. It's, Go ahead, Tosh, sorry. No, I was gonna say, just even thinking about that, you know, how we should question everything that we think of, it, it, it's kind of very philosophical. And I think in general, in our life, we do need to think about that. So this, mm -hmm. it, it's amazing actually how even sitting here and we're talking about the archeology span of tattooing, um, something so true is that actually, why do we think in a certain way? And it's that in itself that we need to be reevaluating ourselves, so yeah. Well, and so this actually sort of connects to the first thing that we, we talked about perhaps discussing today, which is this question of who has the oldest tattoos? Like what are the oldest tattoos? And so back in 2016, the two of us along with uh, Lars and Sebastian uh, wrote an article identifying, you know, clarifying the fact that, that Utzi the Iceman has the oldest preserved tattoos. Stay tuned, that's gonna change soon, soonish. Um, so we'll, we'll talk, I can't really say more about that, but that, that may be changing soon in any case. Um, but all of that research came out of this online discussion uh, on our friend uh, Gemma Angel's Facebook feed where she has been gonna be giving a presentation on tattoo history myth busting. And so she had sort of pulled the room in the, the sort of, his community of historians saying, you know, what are the myths? What are the big myths that we should discuss? And at that time, one of the things that, that we and a couple others suggested was the idea that Utzi was the oldest tattooed mummy. Um, that that we thought was a myth because there was this obscure South American mummy from the Chinchoro culture who actually predated Utzi. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my screen here and pull up a, uh, an image of that of that mummy. Can you guys see this? Yeah, we can see. Yeah, so this is a, this is a drawing, a reconstruction of this mummy from the site of El Moro in Chile. Um, he had what was referred to at the time as a mustache, uh, lines of tattooed dots on either side of his nose. And among those of us who thought we knew better, we thought this mummy was older than Otzi and not just a little bit older, but substantially older like several thousand years older than Otzi. And so this was one of the things we suggested as a myth that should be busted, right? The idea that Otzi had the oldest tattoos. And then in this Facebook message thread over the course of the next, what, six hours or so, Ben? Mm -hmm. um, we all sort of dug into it independently and eventually came up with the original radiocarbon reports for this mummy. And, and over the course of this Facebook message stream, we're able to unbust that myth and identify both that Utsi was the oldest tattooed mummy and to figure out why we were wrong. And, you know, and that's a big part of science, right? Is being able to say, you know, mea culpa, I was wrong. 
based on the data that I had and new information has come to light. And so let's, let's embrace that. Um, you know, this, this is not fascinating science, right? Um, the, the gist of the thing was that there's a difference between radiocarbon dates and years BC and AD. So when you say something is 3000 years old, that doesn't mean it was made or built in 3000 BC. It means it was made or built in 1000 BC, right? There's about a 2000 year difference between years old and radiocarbon age. Mm -hmm. And somewhere along the way, this mummy had been in a very, in a very uh, venerable publication, the age of this mummy had been misreported as being instead of say 3000 years old as being from 3000 BC. And then wow. that had happened wow. a second time. And so over the course of scholarship, the age of this mummy had been accidentally increased by what, 4,000 years, I think. <laughs> and so those of us who, you know, supposedly knew that this was the oldest mummy had been repeating this, but had never actually drilled back into the original radiocarbon data to figure it out. Wow, so, that's unbelievable. Basically, was, you know, was it a con conceptual error or just a typo? But it did, you know, send things tumbling and that's that's the kind of desirable you know checking under the hood crossing the t's and dotting the i's you know every so often before we go forward let's let's go back and check in that black box if everything is that you know or under the hood of the car if everything is still in order i think that that's what it was it was indeed not a great feat of scholarship it was like proofreading yeah but but, but it's it important fun. to do that Oh, and Tosh, I want to mention too for um, uh, viewers on some of these slides that we're going to show, I've included bit links that will get mm -hmm. them to data sets or publications that we're talking about. Um, mm -hmm. And I can, I can throw this one back up in case so that now people will know what is, uh, what is going on there. And what we could do actually um, afterwards yeah. for the viewers, we can put in the description, I will add the links as well then after the Fantastic. live stream. And also for our viewers, if it's your first time um, participating in a live stream, the reason why I say participating is because we want you to ask us questions. So please put them in the kind of the comment section or live chat if you're on YouTube. We have like a special box and I have it on my phone so I can check. Please feel free to write your questions for us and we'll try and answer them as we're going in. Oh, we lost Ben. That's fine. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> ben will come back. Ben was worried that we might have some K-pop blasting from the preteen's bedroom. So I closed the door. <laughs> well, and so as, a, as part of that study, one of the things we did, Tosh, was we actually tried to track down a master database of all of the published tattooed mummies from all over the world. And so that was part of trying to show, you know, who was the oldest, was coming up with this master list. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, that's a thing that's out there now as, as an open source database that um, we just sort of keep on Figshare. Um, and it, it gets updated occasionally as, as we find mistakes that we've made and as, as new things are published. Um, and it's, you know, it's source sites from all over the world. There's a lot from South America. Um, you know, it's mainly arid regions. So the deserts of Western China, um, but there are of course then, you know, from the Philippines, um, one from Central America who Ben thinks, and I think is, he's probably right on this, may actually be a South American mummy that has mm. been misattributed. Um, and, you know, there are others then from the, from the circumpolar regions as well. Wow. Oh, um, I just want to say something about the, 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 the Mexican, um, possible Mexican mummies, just people listening who might be familiar with Mexico or from Mexico. There, there are mummies in the north of Mexico, mummified human remains from dry caves, you know, natural mummified uh, remains. But from the, you know, the culture area of Mesoamerica, you know, that, that area of, of Central America that's culturally united by the use of a calendar, you know, yeah, monumental architecture, et cetera. Um, we have a few reports of mummies, but none of them pan out. I've never seen a mummified human remain from that area. So that there would be one that pops up 
with no actual archaeological excavation, you know, some men found it and it made its way to a, um, a high ranking archaeologist in Mexico City and was somehow traded to France in the trade of pre Columbian artifacts at some point. Um, it, it's just such an outlier, it raises questions. And it's, it's from an era where uh, people from all over the world were going to South America and bringing home souvenirs, um, mm -hmm. not just artifacts, but also mummified remains, right? Go, go to Ensan, bring home a mummy arm, right? Mm -hmm. Like this sort of thing, this, there, there was this, this souvenir trade as well as this early trade in acquiring antiquities for the big museums. And so it's not unreasonable that something like this could have come back to Mexico City via that same process. And then, you know, one, if, if there's no archaeological context to it, you know, we're all just one house fire away from, from not having any idea where the artifacts come from then, right? Like if that, if that original provenance goes away, then you're just guessing. Yeah. Mm. And there's, there's, a, there's a, a whole kind of detective story. I mean, someone who writes these kind of history detective books, you know, would go ahead and do it. You know, we have so much stuff to do. But, um, you know, there's, there are questions of nationalism, nation building, um, politics, and uh, fraud. So that the characters who are involved in this story all make us want to, you know, scratch our head and, and find out more. It's, it's, a, it's a fascinating little side story. That, uh, that I'm very curious about. And well, sorry, go ahead, Tash. No, I was gonna say, so, and I was just gonna explain that we have this map here um, with how many tattooed human mummies do we know of? We don't know um, because a lot of these are 18th or 19th century accounts that will do things and kind of wave their hands and be like, every other mummy we saw in this valley was tattooed or you know, we saw dozens of tattooed mummies in Sudan. Um, and so they don't specify oftentimes even what site they're from, uh, in many cases, how many exactly we were working with, but, you know, well over, well over 100 conservatively at this point. And this map doesn't include unpublished examples. So it doesn't include things in regional museums or personal collections, um, things that have worked their way around the world in that process. These are just things that have been published in the scientific literature. Yeah, we, we've, um, I, I know Aaron wisely told me to maybe uh, hold back on the tourist pictures I was coming up with from, you know, provincial museums or someone's kitchen in Peru. Um, but we've seen incredible tattooing yeah. on mummies that, that aren't included in this list because we don't really know anything about them apart from someone posted it on you know, where have trip advisor or something. <laughs> so yeah, there, there, there are more than in the list out there for sure. Mm. Uh, we actually had a, a really good question here um, from Barbara. Thank you, Barbara, for your question. Um, and they were asking, how was ink produced or discovered? And is there any indication or trace where it came from? So yeah, um, the quick answer is that there are as many recipes for tattooing ink as there are cultures that have tattooed, right? You know, there are, I think, some, some underlying trends. Um, most or all black ink involved, well, let's go with most, black ink involves carb a carbon base, and that could be obtained from soot or from ash or from charcoal, but you know, there are black inks out there that apparently were made from um, earth pigments, from hematite or magnetite as well. Um, other, you know, other earth pigments may or may not have been used. Ben and I have an ongoing, an ongoing uh, feud discussion about uh, ochre use, red ochre use for tattooing and whether or not that might be a thing traditionally. Um, and depending where you go in the world, then those pigment bases are mixed with specific uh, dilutants, so fluids, and binders. And again, those vary incredibly depending on where you're talking about, you know, they can be specific plant uh, juices, um, water from specific places on the landscape, um, breast milk from a woman who gave birth to a baby who had blue eyes. Um, yeah, right, right. So it's, it's, you know, it gets incredibly specific in some locations. Um, we do oftentimes see that those, those 
what do you call them, Ben? The, the, the sort of es esoteric ingredients, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. The, the esoteric ingredients oftentimes may be connected to healing, right? So like, uh, you know, breast milk being a great example of something that actually has uh, some healing properties to it as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, when you step back and look at it like that, you can start to see some commonalities in it. As far as where it all came from, Ben, you want to field this one? Well, I mean, where do the pigments come from? I mean, why, you know, I've been... I think the idea was, um, from my understanding of the question, it was more so like, what could we learn from the tattoos itself in the sense of, if you didn't know where the mummy was from, could you know mm. something from the ink? I think that was the question. Could we analyze the ink um, you know, if we if, didn't know the provenance? We, I, I think it would be hard. We've been looking at some you know, people trying to analyze the composition of inks from within an actual you know, biologically processed pigment that became a tattoo in a mummy. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of impressionistic. And I don't think we could so easily identify, let's say, the esoteric ingredients. So, you know, you're going to have that um, uh, functionally necessary element will be usually a black carbon based pigment, let's say. So you can't, that's, that's what's producing the tattooed mark. And then there'll be some kind of a liquid in which it's, you know, suspended. And this liquid can contain esoteric ingredients, that I like to call. I mean, now we kind of understand why they're there. But at first, when I was doing this world survey, I was, they were esoteric, you know, they were odd. Um, bile is a common one, you know, bile from a python or bile from a bull. Um, honey is another one, you know, and we, we realized, well, they, they got, you know, antibacterial properties, uh, things that accelerate healing and sometimes are associated with beliefs related to healing, bee stings, punctures, all that stuff. So cool. if, if we had an actual, um, you know, when, um, if we had the actual composition of the tattoo ink, if we could figure it out and be like, oh, there's this and that and this esoteric ingredient, we could, you know, kind of draw a circle on the map and say, ah, oh, that's so very Middle Eastern of them. But I don't think we could identify that archaeologically, unless maybe one day we found a little pigment container with some really good looking needles or something and we could analyze it. But then we would and, find it in situ, so. Yeah, and never say never, right? The technology is getting better. You know, like archeologists can do elemental analysis of ancient pigments at this point. But when you think about what that means, you know, so for example, if you're looking at a, a mummy with a, a black ink tattoo, when you do that elemental analysis, when you look at the scope, you're gonna see these huge spikes in carbon because that's the, that's the base element of the thing. And that is gonna basically outstrip all of the other elements uh, to the point where you may not even be able to tell what they are. And then if you think about you know, th those other possible ingredients like say honey or breast milk or whatnot, you know, the elemental signature of those materials at this point, I just, I don't know that we can find them unless they were present in such a great quantity and in such a great state of preservation. I, I don't know that someone with like a PXRF, for example, could figure that out right now. And then, and then there's the other problem is that these esoteric ingredients may not have the physical properties that'll permit them to stay in the place where, where the pigments will. So if they're, you know, soluble or whatever, they're probably just going to be carried through the body, eliminated or stored or whatever as other things that might be introduced into your body uh, subcutaneously. So, you know, you, you're probably not getting the whole potion in, in, in the tattooed mark 15 years later. Some, some stuff is just gone. Yeah. It's my belief, you know, it's an assumption, but. And, and that, that's actually kind of a problem, right? Is this question of how do we test that? Well, really we need to give someone a tattoo and then a thousand years from now, we need to put their body in a condition after they die where it will preserve. And then a thousand years from now, someone needs to come back to this research bucket and dig them up and thin section the tattoo and do the, like the elemental sourcing on it. You know, like it's, 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 hard, it's hard to account for the passage of time when we talk about things like, you know, the degradation of pigment. Hmm. I'm just... Yeah, it's really fascinating. 
it really really is it makes you think how did they even first come across like the idea of tattooing like where did that first come from and actually we had a comment here from Mark Field thank you for your comment and he asked you know I think the first ever tattoo, first ever tattoo was when someone cut themselves and got charcoal ash into the cut. It heals and they have a black scar. Then they have like a light bulb moment. What do you guys think? Uh, well, I, I think it's, it's, it's not, you know, it's not, um, I mean, it's logical to suppose that, it, that, that tattooing would have been discovered accidentally. I mean, there's a whole, you know, there's a whole plethora of ways in which people will get from, um, as a kid, I, I fell on a pencil when I was seven years old and yeah. I had a mark for four or five years in my hand. And it did contribute to my interest in tattooing. I was like, this is fascinating. You know, when you're seven years old, something that stays. Whew. So you can imagine just the, 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 the basic human brain would be like, mm, this is... This is something we can work on. I, I think it's not a crazy idea at all to assume that. No, and and you know, any cultural behavior, right? Whether it's tattooing or making ceramics or cooking cuisine, like all of these things don't just happen overnight, right? They're developed over generations and become this, you know, this process of shared and and um, shared and passed on knowledge through oral traditions and uh, you know things like this. And so it's kind of difficult to then peel all of that away and get back to like, you know, who cooked the first tomato, right? Like that's, that's, it's sort of the same question, you know, like who fell on the stick first? And, you know, tattooing is one of these things that Ben and I have talked about in different places before, you know, there are a couple of different ways you can look at this, right? Like either it's something like the ability to make fire that is just very deeply rooted in who we are as humans, as human animals, and that has been a part of our cultural behavior for hundreds of thousands of years and has diffused across the world with the earliest humans, perhaps. Or it's something like uh, creating ceramics for cooking that was invented independently all over the world at different times to meet different needs by different people. You know, and, and that might account for the differences in tool types and the differences in pigments as if it's something that's being reached independently. And Ben's research on the tool types has been really fascinating is, you know, really eye-opening to me. Um, you know, this idea that when you talk to the public about ancient tattooing, a lot of people default to the idea of hand tattoos from the Pacific as being, you know, the way that all quote unquote ancient tattooing was done, but, but that's not the case. Um, you know, Ben, this is, this is your research, man. You want to, you want to drop some knowledge on this? Um, yeah, well, indeed, you know, we do see, I guess there's like an, um, you know, idealization of the hand tap tools. You, you, you know what we're talking about, Tess, the hand Yeah, I've tool. seen them. Do we have any images for our viewers, Bunny Chan? Yeah, I think we might. Yeah, give me just a second. I'll get that up. And, um, you know, I've seen them pop up. Uh, there was a thing about, there was a TV series about, you know, the, the, the Arthurian myths. Uh, myths. Um, so, you know, King Arthur era people, uh, hand tapping tattoos. And I've seen things on Instagram recently also. Some, you know, people, people uh, interested in, in, in old Russian traditions and portraying themselves uh, using hand tap tools. Um, but the, the hand tapping tools, these kinds of tools that we're seeing up here, um, which are characterized by the perpendicular hafting of the needles. So the needles are set as at not a 90 degree angle, but you know, a, a, an opposing angle to the, is that how we would say Aaron? Yeah, opposing, opposing angle to the handle, sure. To the handle. Um, they have a very well-defined geographic distribution and it, it's, it's hard to imagine that <clears throat> at some point they were all over the world and are only now found in insular Southeast Asia um, and the Pacific. So um, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to find a, a synthetic. I mean, we're looking at a map right here where you see a, a, a nice map that Aaron did with a, a good general distribution of the different techniques. And, what I've always found different basic 
tool forms and techniques. I think it's always good to distinguish the two. Um, you know, there's the shape of the tool, it's general structural characteristics or morphological characteristics, and then the way you use it, that would be the technique. Um, because I was trained as an archeologist, I've, I've um, mainly focused on the morphology of the tools. So their form, which makes it useful um, for archeologists because this, these maps are basically um, derived from research on ethnographic or you know, uh, historically relatively recent peoples and practices. In, in and, and, yeah. And just to interject, you know, and this map is not, again, this is not like universal truth, right? Like this is a very macroscopic scale and you see like conspicuous holes in the map. Um, and that's not, none of, that doesn't indicate that people in those areas weren't tattooing or weren't tattooing with a specific uh, technique or tool set. It just means that we haven't run across the evidence for that yet. Yeah. Um, the, the only exception to that, which, uh, I tried my best, but um, uh, Australia, no tattooing before European contact. None whatsoever at all. Um, New Guinea, though we include it because, I mean, it's a question of resolution and detail, but, you know, the, the, the majority of New Guinea, geographically, culturally, etc., also no tattooing. Um, scarification is, is often... I believe analogous to tattooing among people with certain skin types, which tend to be dark and react to um, uh, incision by producing uh, thick raised scars. Um, and, and people who have that ability or that, that dermatological ability, um, unpigmented scars often take the place of tattooing, though there's some overlap and, and, some dark skinned peoples have practiced tattooing also, you know, that's, it's, it's not uh, completely exclusive, but uh, Australia and New Guinea, um, I think, I think we're safe to say there's, you know, New Guinea has tattooing along the coast. We could talk about it later. Um, but what I wanted to say about this map that's really interesting is that you see general patterns. So the big orange mark is the hand tapping. And hand tapping is found within this big orange space throughout the area where tattooing survives or where we have records of tattooing surviving. Um, it was a like more than predominant, you know, almost completely exclusively hand tapping tools that were used. And um, <clears throat> Bless you. Yeah, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm just blanking. So yeah, it was, it was almost exclusively hand tapping tools that were used and hand tapping tools are used nowhere else in the world. And that kind of tells us that we're not looking at, you know, 150 cases of independent invention of the tool. These tools are more like, most likely related, um, you know, in, in, in a, from a common ancestral culture or they were shared among the people who lived close to each other, there's different possibilities that we could bring up. So that's the best um, example of what uh, people who do um, um, phylogenesis, phylogenesis, making family trees of life or documents or, or technologies, will call a monophyletic group, so a group with a common ancestor. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, if you look at the purple marks, um, that's tattooing by incision. So instead of poking with needles, you uh, make a shallow incision in the skin and introduce pigment that way. Um, ben, just to interrupt me. for a second. Mm -hmm. So here on the screen, just as he's talking about tattooing by incision, on the left-hand side of the screen, you see an iron uh, uh, tool used in uh, Central Africa, uh, the Congo area, to create raised, um, raised scars on the skin. And to the right, you see a set of obsidian implements from, were these Tonga, Ben? Am I right on that? Um, from from no, the Pacific. From Island, Island Melanesia. Okay, yeah, it, 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 that have been identified uh, using use wear and uh, microscopy, so really fancy mi microscopes, to identify that the, the small 
uh, protrusions, the little graver tips that you see highlighted using arrows on the screen, that each one of those has evidence that it was used to pierce skin. Oh, God, um, no. Yeah, right. Really? Um, and, and most of them seem to have evidence that instead of slicing, that the piercing was in more of a uh, deliberate um, straight in fashion. So in other words, this is, this is, these don't seem to be um, consistent with butchering, for example. Instead, they seem to be uh, consistent with scarification or tattooing, perhaps. So sorry, Ben, go ahead. No, and, and interestingly enough, uh, perhaps also more akin to tattooing by puncture, like with a needle, than actual incised tattooing, where you'd make a, a continuous line. F from what I understand, you know, you, you see there's some little, little points sticking out on the gravers. And... Um, that's what the authors believe might have been the business end of it. Um, I must say that although there's some interesting stuff in, in, in this paper and others related to it, I still have a lot of problems with a lot of the conclusions they come to. But I mean, that's, that's another story, but I need to point it out. <laughs> I have an issue with it. So what I was mentioning is that the, the distribution of tattooing by incision appears quite random compared to the distribution of uh, tattooing with hand tapping tools. And this suggests independent invention. You know, there's, there's just no reason why these such disparate groups, I mean, we can't, uh, you know, they, there's no easy, um, oh, it's, uh, it's a common ancestral trait that people have just held over for a hundred thousand years. You know, it, it seems to have cropped up independently in different places. And one, one of my hypotheses though, I mean, it's not completely clean in the sense that it doesn't hold true absolutely everywhere, but is that this random distribution reflects access to very sharp materials. Got, tattooing by incision works well if you have something very sharp. And, and that's because the whole process of tattooing requires in the ideal situation the least possible trauma to the skin um you know traumatic events on the skin can um can lead to rejection of pigment or absorption through subcutaneous fluids if it's too deep so you know you, you can't go at it with a saw or a shark's tooth it's not going to work you, you, you need something that permits a, a a nice clean shallow incision that'll heal well may not bleed too much. And uh, if, if, if we look at the resources people had on hand, um, one thing that comes up, uh, the tools that we've seen illustrated, and we see it also uh, in, in Melanesia, we see it also in uh, Mesoamerica among the Maya, that people had access to obsidian, which is volcanic glass, which um, I remember from my archeology span class, the archeology span textbooks we had, um, they, they would talk about an experiment that was done with obsidian uh, scalpels for surgery and that the healing was better than the best surgical scalpels. I mean, it's such a, a sharp tool. And I've held Mayan obsidian blades that just from the light weight of the blade sinks right into your hand. Like you have a terrible cut from holding it. So, um, so there it seems more that the environment and the resources available kind of dictated where the tattooing would go, where, where hand tapping seems to be a cultural prescription. It's something that once you learned from your predecessors, you never forget and you never let go. It's a very different forces leading to the shape tattooing instruments can take. So kind of speak ended that. No, it's brilliant. The, the most widespread, you know, tool is, is um, uh, uh, the needle. The needle is just probably technologically the most efficient way to obtain a tattooed mark with the least possible uh, complications and also not a hard thing to find or obtain from natural thorns, bone needles, um, eventually metal needles, obviously. Everybody went crazy for the metal needle when they had access to it. Uh, palm spines. And yeah, we see here, um, tattooing by puncture, either with a, you know, a needle 
just the needle or thorn in the hand or hafting them in line with the handle, which is like the simple, basic, most universal form of uh, uh, tattooing tool and technique. Here we see different techniques. So the middle one is the Japanese technique. Um, the one on the right is uh, the Indo-Chinese, Thai, Burmese technique. And then, um, you know, just some more uh, generic pencil-like holes. Or... And before, you know, up until the invention of electricity and the widespread use of electricity, hand poking was the default style of tattooing uh, in Europe and North America too. And so um, in this image, the, the image to the right are the tools that were used by uh, Gus Wagner, who was one of the really early prolific American tattooists. And to the left are uh, cactus spines, bundled cactus spines from the, uh, the Chaco region, Grand Chaco region of, of Argentina, I believe. Um, and you know, it, it's, it's essentially the same technology. The, the ones on the right are more, more uh, contemporary, they're more uh, they're Iron Age, right? So they're using these metal tips instead of having tips that are disposable. But you know, this, is, this sort of illustrates one of the problems with talking about tattooing from an archeological perspective is that once these things go into the earth, it's very hard to figure out that they were ever there, right? The cactus spines on the left within a generation or two of being left in the earth, there's just not gonna be anything left of them at all. If you're excavating a site, you will never find them. Uh, the ones to the right, the wooden handles are gonna break down and you'll be left with these very small metal tips. And so when you find those in your archeological screen, you know, what do you do with them then? Are they sewing needles? Are they awls for puncturing hides? Are they something used in weaving? Um, you know, or do we just kind of, you know, gloss them over as needle and then just put them in our archeological bags and that's, that's the end of the interpretation. And so this is, I think a big, you know, a big root of the problem of why we don't know more about the tool types used to tattoo traditionally around the globe is because they haven't stuck around for the most part or only certain portions of them have stuck around. Yeah, I've been, um, I've been looking for um, cactus spines in, uh, in uh, uh, Andean archeological context. None are coming up. And the, I, I was talking about this to Aaron recently. It's, it's, it's what's <laughs> on my mind right now. Um, you know, talking about the environmental forces that'll shape the form that tattooing instruments take. Um, Cactuses are native to the Americas. So before contact, I believe there were cactuses nowhere else. I mean, they pop up now. I've seen pictures of cactuses outside of North America, but, um, and in all the desert regions where cactus grow and people tattooed, when we have accounts, it's the, 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 the cactus spine is the go-to thing. Um, the problem what we're running into with, uh, with Peru or in the Andes is we basically don't have any contact period. So, you know, when the Spaniards came and they described what the people were doing while they were, you know, forcing them uh, to stop doing them, uh, we don't have descriptions of people on the desert coast of Peru, how they actually tattooed. And since they're in the desert and it's the one place we don't have testimony, I'm thinking it's the most likely tool that they would have used because everybody else who's a desert person in the Americas, their go-to thing is the cactus spine. But we're not, I'm not finding the cactus spine in the archeological reports. So are they not surviving? Were they not buried with the people? And can I go ahead and tell a success story? A recent, yes, recent find that actually connects to cactus spines there. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and pull up my screen again here. Um, so a couple of years ago, a, a friend and colleague of mine, Andrew Gilworth Brown, who's out at um, University of Washington, uh, he's a graduate student out there. And he was working with an archeological collection from uh, Southern Utah here in the United States in the Southwest. And this was a site that had been looted um, by treasure hunters. And then archeologists went in to do a salvage excavation. So they went in and they uh, cut a profile into that looter pit and sampled it. They took everything 
and sampled it down to like microscopic grain size when they sorted it so that they could figure out what might have been lost in this looter excavation. And the preservation at this site, the turkey pen site was just incredible, right? There are intact human hairs. Um, there, it's actually, uh, when it was partially excavated about a century ago, there was so much preserved turkey feces at the site that the archeologists gave up because they were tired of digging through turkey crap. Um, so, you know, this, this tells you the level of preservation, right? And one of the objects that had come out of that excavation, out of the archeological salvage, was this. It's, it's a uh, lemonade sumac twig. It's only about 10 centimeters long. And on the tip, pressed into the pith of the twig are two uh, prickly pear cactus spines. And then the tip is bound with, uh, with yucca fiber. And Andrew, for his graduate work, was sorting through and documenting the material from this excavation and saw this tool, this very unusual two-spine tool with this black staining on the tip of it and said, hey, what if that was used to tattoo? And so Andrew reached out to me. I was really fortunate to be a part of this. Um, but Andrew led the study then where we actually then tried to, or I think we succeeded in looking very carefully at this tool from an archeological science perspective and trying to prove that it, it was used to tattoo rather than say to, um, uh, in, or to put uh, punctures into ceramic figurines or something like this. And to do that, we, we got involved in this whole experimental archeological process where uh, Andrew made replicas of this tool using the same material. So first he identified all of the biological components and then made replicas of the tool and then used them to tattoo. Uh, initial experiments were done on pigskin. Um, anecdotally, it's been used, similar tools have been used since then on people um, with excellent results. But at the microscopic level, what he showed, so on this slide, you see one of the replicas, you show it in use, and then over to the right, you see a scanning electron microscope image of the cactus spines at the top before they've been used to tattoo. And at the bottom, after they've been used to tattoo. And so what you see there is the morphological change, the structural change to the cactus spine, where after just five minutes of tattooing, all of these microscopic barbs that are present on the cactus spine strip off in the skin, but they only skip off, they only strip off to about two or three millimeters of the tip of the spine, which makes sense. That's the only, that's how much it's going into the skin. Now, so then Andrew was able to compare that to the images of the artifact that itself, of itself and show that there was a correspondence between the microscopic wear patterns on our experimental tools and on the actual artifact. Uh, something else cool, if you look at this close up in this image, you can see that one of the spines is slightly shorter than the other one. Um, it apparently broke during tattooing but was used for long enough that the pigment then covers the broken tip of the spine. So on the very tip where it's shorter, you can see the black pigment is still there. So who knows, this may have been why this artifact was discarded. It was actually recovered from a midden, so from a trash pit. So, you know, it's entirely reasonable that when you're using a cactus spines to tattoo somebody and one of them breaks, maybe you get a couple punctures after that, but then you're gonna throw the thing away and, and make a new one. And the image to the upper right is another scanning electron microscope image where he was able to actually suss out the pigment material. So what that is, is that is carbon. It is pulverized charcoal that has been ground down and we think used as the base for the pigment. And then as it was being used to tattoo that embedded into the surface of the artifact. Um, the scale on the lower right there uh, is uh, only 10 nanometers big. So you can get an idea of you know, what, what zoom level we are on this thing. But, you know, this was a, a great example of finding something that could have been used to tattoo and then actually taking the steps to show that it was. And that's the sort of thing that I think a lot of what Ben and I talk about with each other is based around is this idea that, you know, yeah, a lot of things could be used to tattoo, but can we prove it? And if we can't, it doesn't necessarily mean they weren't. It just means we should be more circumspect in talking about them. So we shouldn't necessarily just say the ancient Britons tattooed with iron needles, right? Because there's not actually specific evidence to back that up. So may have tattooed 
with iron needles is a better way to approach that. I'm going to back up here for a second. So this, this bit link down at the bottom there, uh, that study was po published as open access. And so that is, uh, that's available for anybody to, uh, to download the published study as well. I can't believe that, you know, they potentially used a cactus spine. I can't get but, over that. I think it's brilliant. Yeah, but again, what, what Ben was saying holds up, right? When you look at the, uh, the ethnographic and uh, indigenous traditions in the Southwest, Southwestern United States, I mean, overwhelmingly people were using cactus spines to tattoo before the invention of metal needles, like in preference to bone or stone or any other tool, they're using cactus spines. So it's, it's obviously a great technology. Um, anecdotally from people who have been tattooed with cactus spines, they're like, yeah, it's, it's not that bad. You know, it's really not that much worse than like hand poking with, uh, you know, with steel needles, but, uh, you know, that's, that, that, that itself is not good science, right? <laughs> like, when the endorphins start kicking in, who knows how much it really hurts. Mm. And if I remember correctly, do we have an example of, I think, was it hand poking? I think there's a little short video that you have. Oh yeah. Let me see if I can find that. Um, I had a video of, uh, the hand poking itself. And that seems to have perhaps escaped me. So for um, our viewers at home, whilst Aaron is going to hopefully find this video clip, if you are a bit squeamish, I don't recommend you watching this part because obviously we will be seeing um, a tool going into the skin. So if you do, don't like that sort of stuff, then maybe not watch it. <laughs> um, but I think it's very cool. Um, have yeah, you found it? No, I haven't yet. Give me just a one second. I got to get into my files here. You guys, you guys keep talking. That's, mm -hmm. that's fine. Don't worry. We do have a few questions coming in. Um, I think what we will do, we'll leave the questions about Otzi a little bit later because we do have a few slides about that. So we can maybe deal with that all together in one part. Um, jim, 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 jim. Hello to Oresta Sab from Greece. Thank you for tuning in. Oh, this is very cool. There's some evidence of mountain tribes in the Balkan Peninsula using Batsina, which is a herb similar to cactus uh, as the tattooing needles. Ah, interesting. I didn't know. There you go. That's interesting. Oh, is this it, is this. Hmm? Oh, yeah. It's kind of hard to, you know, I guess we could still ask, though. It. What kind of plant is it? Is it? Is it like a tree with thorns? Well, um, and while, while they're maybe answering, I've got the video now if you guys want okay. to see this. And so this is a this is just a video of experimental testing. Uh, there, I showed you the still photo earlier but this is of using these cactus spines to tattoo pig skin. Um, and, you know, we've posted this online before. And of course, everybody was like, it's too deep, it's too deep. And this is zoomed way in. So that blob of pigment you see on the tip of the spines, about uh, a little bit up from the tip of the spines, that's actually about two meters from the tip, of, or two millimeters from the tip of the spine. So we're zoomed in very close here. And it's really only going about, about two, two and a half millimeters into the skin, which, um, structurally is about the sweet spot for putting ink into skin, depending on where you are in the body. Um, the epidermis is, you know, thicker or thinner, depending on what, what part of the body you're talking about, but you want to get through the epidermis, but not breach the dermal boundary. And if you breach that dermal layer, then you're going to get blown out lines. The body's going to take that ink away. Um, it's going to, you know, it's not going to encapsulate then at that juncture. So as a general rule, two millimeters seems to be about the sweet spot. Mm. And and the blowout Aaron's referring to is that the subcutaneous fluids spread the pigment out, so it, you know it 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 diverges from a nice clean line. It's like kind of oof, smudging. And just as an aside, you know that's that's think uh, lines being blown out is something that we tend to associate with non-professional tattooing. Um, you know, stick and poke in the backyard, uh, people that were tattooed on ships in the Pacific in World War II by their buddies, you know, not done by professional tattooists. But we see virtually no blowouts in the mummified remains. Um, you know, the ancient tattooing was not done by like some dude who picked up a cactus spine and was like, hey, buddy, Look what I got for you, right? Like this is a practice that was that was integral to these cultures. It was done by 
trained and expert practitioners who were oftentimes then also, you know, healers and revered members of the society. Now, the one exception I will say is that when you look at the microscopic images of Utzi's tattoos, a couple of those look really blown out to me. And that's hard to parse out because the man doesn't have any epidermis left, right? The, the, the thousands of years into the glacier totally stripped away his epidermis. And so when you see Otzi's tattoos, you're looking at the ink resting directly on top of the dermal layer. But the microscope images of those tattoos around the solid lines, they get very, very ephemeral. Um, and I can try to pull up one of those images here real quick too. Mm. And whilst you're doing that, Aaron, um, Ben, um, they replied saying that um, they, it, it is a thorned bush and they've been researching Balkan tattooing traditions for a while. So there you go. You might have a new link there, you two. Okay. Should connect. Right on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, please, uh, that person, please, uh, you know, PM us on the Instagram, um, reach out. We'd love to learn more. Mm -hmm. um, and so this, this image that I just called up shows, let's see the Iceman. Uh, to the left, you see the man himself with all of his tattoo locations marked. And on the right-hand side of the, of the screen at the top, you see his uh, left wrist tattoo. And then below that, uh, very detailed um, alternative imaging. So uh, this, I think, believe are uh, infrared photogra photography, infrared photographs taken very close up of his actual tattoos. And the original versions of these images are much higher resolution and so you can zoom a long way into them. But uh, do you guys see my mouse mm -hmm. on the screen? So for example, this down here, you see these kind of big areas at one end of the lines and then they get narrower as they progress. And so that's one of the things that uh, Ben and I and some other people have been talking about is, you know, can we look at this sort of evidence and maybe parse out in some way how he may have been tattooed? What tools were used or what techniques were used? By the way, for any of our viewers at home, um, Otzi was found in 1991 um, in the Alps, if I remember correctly, between Austria and Italy. Yep. Um, and the name comes from, from the area that they found it. Um, and it's really one of the most fascinating finds because when they found the individual, when they found the mummified corpse, um, they thought it was somebody who had recently passed away. So when they had seen, I guess, some part of a limb, or even the head, um, they went at it with little picks to see, you know, because they thought it was somebody who recently was found. So we do see that when they do their analysis that it has been slightly disturbed due to when it was actually uncovered in, in 1991. But it is, if I remember correctly, 3,000... 3,200 BC, give or take, a radiocarbon curve. Mm. Yeah. And there is a museum dedicated to Otzi, if I remember correctly, as well. You can there go. is, the, the South Tyrol Museum. And yeah. some of his tattoos were visible the day he was found. Literally, the day he was found, you can see them on his body as they come out of the ice. And there are a couple of very early discussions of him when they were still not 100% not sure whether he was ancient or historic or modern. Mm -hmm. where uh, I believe it's a newspaper account or two that talks about the tattoos and how, you know, probably then he was a criminal because he had these tattoos on him. And so undoubtedly his criminal gang had turned on him and left him to die on the glacier. Um, you know, which is, is of course, you know, the, the, a fantastic, fantastic example of the, the, the anti-tattooing bias that has, has been around for a, a good portion of modern history. Um, we know now that he has 61 tattoos. They found the last set of marks in 2014. 15 or 2016, I think, using, I believe, infrared imagery. Uh, they were actually able to look at this T15 mark on his rib cage. The skin is folded over there, and so they're not visible to the naked eye, but they were able to literally look through the skin using these, these imaging techniques and find this last set of lines. It's really, I, I remember learning about it at university, and it's one of those things that definitely a lot of archaeologists will be introduced at the beginning of their studies. Um, how do you feel about the idea of this being acupuncture? Because we do have a few questions coming in where people do assume, right, and they've interpreted these marks as acupuncture related incisions, I think is the correct term. Um, we actually have a few questions regarding that, so I'll ask 
I'll, I'll word it how they have, if that's okay. So um, Gibson HD asked, well, has stated, I've only heard Oatsy had tattooed signs of acupuncture. Was it commonly practiced on other preserved bummies? Well, maybe this first to answer the first part anyway. Yeah, so Ben, you mind if I take a stab at this first? Go ahead. Okay, so <laughs> some of Oatsy's tattoos, but not all of them, correspond to areas on his body where we can tell he suffered from muscular ailments. Some, but not all. Um, it has been pointed out that I think virtually all, if not all of his tattoos correspond with locations of, or fall on the locations of traditional acupuncture meridians, Chinese uh, medicine meridians. Um, but, I think there's, I think it's important to acknowledge the difference between right correlation and causation here. Um, our colleague Luke Renault has pointed out that there are so many acupuncture meridians on the human body that it's virtually impossible to put a tattoo on the human body without putting it on an acupuncture meridian. So the fact that these marks are on meridians doesn't necessarily mean that that is the reason they are there. Right now, it doesn't also doesn't mean that it's not the reason that they were there. So he may well have been tattooed at certain locations on his body as a medicinal or therapeutic treatment. But for me, one of the things that has always stuck in the back of my head is this idea then that that is the only reason he was tattooed. And I think a lot of that has to do with traditional biases about ancient art. Um, you know, when we look, for example, at the, uh, the, the Scythian mummies that have tattoos, it's very easy to look at them and say, oh, well, that's a horse or a ram or a, you know, a griffin, because we can interpret and understand those, me those symbols. Just because we don't understand what these symbols meant to him doesn't mean they were meaningless. And I think that's an important thing to remember. You know, all over the world, there are tattooing traditions that where the marks are symbolic and meaningful to the people and the culture that made them. But as an outsider, we wouldn't recognize what they are. Uh, ben, you wanna, you got anything on this then? Well, I think, um, yeah, I, 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 I think it's, uh, it's um, it may be counterintuitive to people. And that's why we often see this notion that the more figurative, the tattooing is the more deeply meaningful it might uh, it might be, and then if it's less figurative, you know, abstract or simple, then somehow there's this logic that people go through that makes them conclude that then it, it had a functional, um, you know, there was no meaning attached. It was just a kind of functional thing, which I think can be demonstrated to be not true at all. I mean, you yeah, know, the symbolism and stuff can be very, very simple. Yeah, and, clear, uh, clear examples from other places in the world. Uh, the you know circumpolar tattooing, right, where parallel lines or lines that converge to a triangle that don't hold symbolic value to us as outsiders have this complex, deeply rooted value that you know connects to specific uh, you know oral histories and traditions and traditional knowledge that someone within that culture would immediately understand and appreciate, but that we on the outside can't. Um, mm -hmm. Again, all of that is not to say that his tattoos were not therapeutic. There are known examples of therapeutic tattooing different places around the globe, mm -hmm. but I don't think we should just draw a line in the sand and say, you know, Utsi, the man himself was only tattooed to treat his ailments. And, and, and obviously this, therapeutic tattooing um, most likely is, is not directly connected to traditional Chinese medicine, which is yep. where acupuncture is from. And um, as our colleague Luc Renault po also pointed out, um, acupuncture was nowhere near existing in any kind of form that we know now with meridian charts and whatnot 5,000 years ago. So it, it's a much more recent development within Chinese culture. Um, I, mean, I highly recommend anybody who speaks French, I'm sorry we don't have the link, but you know, if you speak French, even a bit, 
and you're interested in these questions, I think Le Grenot really went through it in a very thorough way. Um, what we can say and think and, and uh, imagine about um, the therap therapeutic, the possible therapeutic function of Otsi statues. I think he kind of concludes that there could very well be a therapeutic component, but that it's not acupuncture. And the acupuncture is really a misnomer and a, a, a kind of transposition of something that happens later elsewhere. And, and I mean, in popular culture, it, 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 you know, it's become a meme, Otsi and acupuncture. But there's a, there's a chronological problem and, and just, you know, we can't, we can't really tell either. As Aaron was saying, that just the question of the, the, the likelihood of hitting an a acupuncture point with a tattoo is so high. Um, that itself doesn't, doesn't provide convincing, conclusive evidence. I'm curious if there's any of our viewers watching, if you're a tattooist, what is your take on this? Did you know about some of this before? Um, how is it to see the tools, the evolution of tools? I'm curious to see your thoughts on it. So please, if you're a tattooist, write a little comment, that'd be great. And if I remember correctly, Rocking Bo Bikin, you are a tattooist. I remember seeing you comment on another video for the advert for this stream. And I, I just love it. He just goes, he could have been tattooed for many reasons, for sure. Even more than one reason. And it's so true. You know, that's the way we've got to look at it. And he even goes on to say tattoos are often a rite of passage or ritual. Absolutely. And, and I think that this is a great example of that kind of black box idea that we were talking about before, right? Is that, you know, then in the popular culture and the popular media, and as Ben said, as memes, you know, we have this, you know, Otis tattoos, Otis tattoos equal um, acupuncture. And that within that black box of, how he was tattooed, why he was tattooed. There's a lot more that could be going on there that it's important to at least acknowledge could be there. Hmm. And I think as it stands, you know, with Ertzi, it's, it's the best we can do in, in, in this whole black box is um, look at it from a probabilistic point of view. I mean, he could have been tattooed for any reason that we know people were tattooed for. And he could have been tattooed with every and any technique we know of. But some answers are much more likely and some answers are much less likely. And that actually is a thing that goes back to what Ben was talking about before about the tool forms. So there is this sort of popularly reported story that Utzi's tattoos were incised into his skin. Um, and that, that appears you know, throughout the internet, throughout the secondary sources on tattooing and on the past. But there's actually, at least to date, there has not been published any direct physical evidence that supports that conclusion. So that is total supposition on the part of, well, Luke Renaud did a great job going back to where that myth originated. Um, and it basically comes back to Check me on this, Ben. Right? It was, is it one of the one of the early people who had looked at Otsi was passingly familiar with this Tibetan ritual practice in which herbs were burned on the skin. Yeah. And so, just based on that little bit of information, he concluded that Otsi's tattoos were cut into the skin, packed with herbs, and set on fire. And again, like there's there's zero actual contextual or physical evidence to support that, but pieces of that idea being that they were cut into the skin, have just been now regurgitated to the point that we consider them to be, you know, capital F facts. And, and you know, that just from a technological point of view and a, you know, biological point of view, tattooing being a techno-biological phenomenon, um, I don't think you can leave a tattooed mark by burning a bunch of, uh, uh, vegetable, dried vegetable matter in uh, in a big cut. I don't think it's going to work. I think it'll just leave a scar. And this um, again gets into that, like, how do we test that, right? Yeah. Where does science come in on this? Brave people, right? You, brave people are willing to get burnt on their arms. Yeah, There's, good, good um, releases written up by good lawyers. Yeah. <laughs> Outside of the university, I think yes. the ethical guidelines are not don't permit this kind of nonsense, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and there's um, 
there's uh, the, 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 that, that whole question, you know, of um, putting that in the black box. You know, the guy who did it, I think, I think it might be Reinhold Messner, the famous mountaineer. Could be. Yeah, so the guy was a mountaineer, so he knew the Himalaya, and he just suggested this, and people just jumped onto it. I mean, you know, tattoo scholarship is 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 still such a you say nascent. It's still in its infancy, and 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 at the time of Ertzi, there was nobody really um, habilitated to come in and say, okay, well, look at the tattoos and produce some kind of, you know, solid guesswork. So instead we had kind of weak guesswork, unfortunately. And also I think, you know, there was that reluctance to consult the tattooing community as well. I mean, you know, if, the, if, if Messner, let's say it was him, had, had turned around and asked his local tattooist, how are these marks made? Then we probably wouldn't be talking about this right now because he would have gotten a much different answer from somebody who had a much different uh, viewpoint and more incisive viewpoint uh, than he did on the matter. I just feel like it's it's so interesting how you know there's so many aspects to this that we need to address, and there's never going to be enough time to do that. <laughs> but it's it's one of those things. I know um, we should mention that you do have a book called Ancient Ink. I put the link in the description below. That will give you a great introduction into the archaeology around tattooing across the world. And I think that's something that people could maybe go to because if you definitely are feeling like more interested in the subject after watching the stream, I do fully recommend it. I have it myself. You can actually get the uh, Kindle version, the PDF version. So the description did, box. Did they fix the film formatting on the Kindle version? The e-formatting was miserable there for a little bit, but is it does it look okay now on the ebook? To me, it looks fine. Okay, good, good, good. Yeah. It does look fine on my phone. It looks fine, and on the okay. laptop. So <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> um, uh, what's I gonna say? Oh, yep. Yeah, so don't forget to follow the guys on Instagram. Their link as well. It's Archaeology Inc. And it's the first time you're coming across this YouTube channel. Please hit that subscribe button. Don't forget to hit that like and comment as well, please. We do appreciate your comments, not just in the live chat box, but in the actual video where it lives. Um, wow, just we're going at just. Just to interject, I just want to say I hope everybody watching is going to tune in to uh, Channel 4 on Wednesday <laughs> for uh, Tasha's uh, small screen debut as part of the uh, the Great British Dig. Is that right? That is right. Thank you. There you go. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It's so close. But that's fine. That, that could be next week. We'll deal with that. Okay. I think we, we might have some live streams associated with that um, and with the show to, to give you a better insight into the post excavation, especially because obviously that's not going to be on TV. So we'll, we'll try to do some live streams on that. Um, but sh what should we say? Should we say another, try to go another, what, 10 minutes? Answer oh, the questions oh. that we have. Is that okay? Yeah, oh, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Time. Let's just try, yeah. let's try, let's try to get it in 15 minutes. Oh. Otherwise, um, yeah, because it's already nearly, it's what, one hour, 20 minutes in, so. All right, concise answers. We can do concise yeah. answers. Let's, let's, let's try yeah. that, All right. okay? What is it, um, and, a lightning round? <laughs> that's, that's right exactly lightning round 20 questions 20 minutes off your tea let's go <laughs> black ink or color oh ben's quiet there ben black ink or color that's a good point black ink or color it, 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 in what context for oh, you good. man for me for you. Black, black no color black. yeah concur okay <laughs> i think the same okay. colors for kids no <laughs> i don't know She's acting cool. <laughs> I'm curious, what do you think about um, skin tone color tattoos, right? So if I, apparently now there's a thing, like, so for example, I could get brown ink. I could get tattooed in brown ink. But apparently I think it goes to with the skin, it actually dissolves a lot faster, it doesn't last as long. I think black ink lasts the most, no matter what you're doing, and no matter what time period. I think black ink is really the one that, that survives. B bold will hold, as they say, yeah. <laughs> Okay. You know, going, uh, just touching on uh, on Aaron and I's discussion about ochre, um, it, it led mm -hmm. me to look into um, cosmetic tattooing because cosmetic tattooing uses a lot of this skin tone type stuff, and and some of it includes ochre based pigments apparently, and I have a feeling that they don't um, last so well as other types of pigment, earth pigments, when used in tattooing. 
I think they again, can. we need a 10 year study and then a thousand year study to uh, back it up. Some experimental archaeology right there. If yeah. anyone's interested in a dissertation topic. This is actually All right, so hit us with questions. What do you got? Yeah, okay, <laughs> questions. Okay, let's go, let's go. Okay, Paul Rue asks, do, 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 where did it go? Paul asked if you could talk about the Lapita culture as a spreader of tattooing. Oh, we know Paul. Hello, Paul. Yeah. Hey. He's an old school tattooist, I believe. Yeah. Oh, yes, um, 24 years. He said he's been yeah. 24 years yeah. tattooing. Wow. Yeah. I like well, it from the UK too. <laughs> so this this connects to what Ben was saying earlier about the uh, the spread of uh, hand tapping tattoos. Mm -hmm. um, that seems to be intimately connected to the Austronesian language family and the spread of that language family through the Pacific. Um, and archaeologically, the oldest evidence or the first evidence for those migrations are the Lapita culture. Yeah. Um, within within uh, Oceania. Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we therefore think that the Lapita culture was probably tattooing. Some of their material culture, um, ceramic designs and things like this seem to be mirrored in later uh, Pacific tattooing that we know of, you know, like historic examples of it. Um, those obsidian blades we showed you earlier are actually pre-Lapita. So it may be that people were tattooing before the Lapita culture entered the Pacific. Mm -hmm. but using a different style of it. And I don't think so. But um, <laughs> the, the thing is, is from a technological point of view, um, when uh, that study I mentioned I wasn't agreeing with is the one we're referencing here, which, which looked at these obsidian tools and suggested that perhaps tattooing wasn't introduced by the Lapita peoples but was, had an, uh, a local origin, which is all part of a greater debate between how local and how intrusive um, is the Lapita culture and its descendants? How much did it absorb coming into the territory from somewhere else, et cetera? Um, from a technological point of view, it seems quite clear that the tattooing traditions of the Pacific, which are thought to originate among the Lapita people, the specific technological traditions. Um, <laughs> it seems quite clear that they're intrusive and that they came in with migrating Austronesians, the tool form. So if there was something there before, um, it's not a direct ancestor of the tattooing we see in the Pacific. The tattooing we see in the Pacific seems to um, be a common inherited cultural trait of all Austronesian peoples, which came from Southeast Asia, maybe five, 6,000 years ago, started moving out and entered um, the Pacific and formed that Lapita culture that Paul is referring to. Um, what is it, 3,000 years ago? I think that it's, this is an evolving story, right? The, the genetics and the archeology span of that migration of those migrations, I guess there's more than one connected with this, is still something that is that is evolving. Please tr don't trust me on any dates. <laughs> I'm the worst archaeology student ever. I suck at dates. <laughs> circa, circa 3,000 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> Long time ago. <laughs> hey, Paul, shoot us, shoot us a message if you want to talk about that more. Any, any of these questions, um, we'll try to keep it short, but if people want to know, yeah. if people want us to to deep dive on this stuff, by all means, message us. Mm -hmm. mm. And Paul, if you're based in the UK and you said you do, if you say you a tattoo by hand in multiple styles, do you, if you do hand poking, let me know. Send me a message. I want to get. I want to do some stuff like that. Not my. I would like to have the tattoo, not to do it myself. Actually, I could try. I don't think that will go very well. <laughs> I probably will end up being A and E. Um, I'm probably poisoning myself, but it's fine. Um, right. Questions. Let's see this, Lucy. Do, 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 do. Um, see. Oh, interesting. So Rocking Bo Bokin was um, just making a comment about the Lapita. It is important. But what about tap tattoos? Maybe that is actually where it started from. Um, let's see. Uh, a great, we're getting loads of people are loving the stream. Barbara, great. She goes, you guys are amazing. It's one of the best live chats that I really enjoyed. Maybe you guys need to do some videos. Maybe we should talk about that. Ah, Paul's in the U in uh, New York. Damn it. 
if you're in the UK, let me know. Or if anyone actually who's a tattoo art- artist who does hand poking, <laughs> it's a perfect time now. <laughs> and you're based in London, let me know. <laughs> um, dum, dum, dum. Let's go. Uh, I'm trying to find questions. I, I can Need- give a one line answer to the tapping thing. Oh, okay. Because um, so the, the tapping doesn't start with the Lapita people, if we're going to look at it that way. It, it mm-hmm. would start in Southeast Asia and mm-hmm. move, move along migration routes into that area. But what might start at Lapita or post Lapita people just afterwards is making bone combs as opposed to assembling thorns or needles of other origin together to form the comb. The actual bone comb seems to be something that was first developed in the Pacific. And we we don't find archaeological evidence of bone tattooing combs anywhere else. But when we find them in the Pacific, their function is really obvious. They're bone tattooing tools that were most likely hafted in a way that you could hand tap. So, Hmm. That's very interesting. To be honest, when I think of early technologies, I would have assumed that actually that it was bone. That's why actually I just assumed that there were bones. Um, We have another question from Florida Public Archaeology Network. Thank you for your question and hello. Um, they said, this is now referring to quite at the beginning when you had the map of, I think we had um, tattoos of mummies, the location of where you found them. And they just made a comment about how the surprise of a lack from the Southwest US, considering how dry the climate is there. Any ideas of why? Is this because there was a lack of tattooing or just a lack of mummified remains? Well, that's a, that's a great question. And it's absolutely not because there was a lack of tattooing. Um, you know, by the 17th, 16th, 17th, 18th century, we know that most indigenous peoples living in the American Southwest were tattooing. And that is, you know, the coastal zone all the way from Washington state down through the Baja Peninsula, uh, up into the Colorado Plateau. You know, if you draw that in a specific regional map, the outliers are the places that weren't tattooing. Um, you know, of course, all of those traditions were then, then by and large, lost and stamped out by, by Western uh, colonial and acculturative forces. But um, that is an excellent question about why there are no tattooed mummies from the Southwest. Um, there are mummified remains from the Southwest, um, but very few of them have been specifically investigated for tattoos. And there's also cultural issues today that go into looking at preserved Native American remains um, and rules and laws and, uh, you know, ethical concerns that, that dictate how we or if we can do that. So it's, it's definitely not a lack of tattooing. It's probably a sample error would be my guess. Hmm. And actually, um, Gibson HD has just made him just wondering if they have, if you know of a, um, a database, I think it's a database. Yeah, is there a place for experimental data in tattoo-based experiments? Do you know of a database that holds, no. I think it's still personal no. research really, isn't it, really? Unless yeah. you go on Instagram, I mean, people are posting their versions of what they do. Yeah. Um, well, and you know, there's, there's, you know, people have been, modern tattooists have been experimenting with different techniques and different styles and using older techniques and older styles and older tools for, you know, a century. Right. Um, but unfortunately a lot of that work hasn't then been rolled into, um, you know, a scientific setting where there are, um, you know, controls in the experiment and hypotheses and abilities to retest and things like this. And so a lot of that information is anecdotal. And that's why, you know, it's really important to reach out to other people is because it's settings like this where people can log into the chat and be like, hey, well, I tried tattooing with cactus spines and it was a miserable failure, right? Like that's, that's good, important anecdotal data, but there's, there is no single database we can turn to for that at this point. Mm. Yeah, like all these, you know, avocational experiments, they, they let us know, oh, you could tattoo with this, but it does, it doesn't go further. I mean, if people are not going to analyze the traces on the tools and compare them to archaeological tools, it just becomes an exploration of the realm of possibilities in tattooing, which is interesting in itself, but you know, it is what it is. There's, 
like famous, you know, the, the uh, New York's uh, tattooist spider web uh, in the old days, um, tattooing someone, tattooing a rose on someone with a rose thorn, conceptual. But, you know, it's a curiosity. It, it's not experimental archaeology. I'm just trying to imagine a, a rose thorn being used. Oh, I can just imagine that getting stuck. Anyway, unless it's not fastened properly. <laughs> mm. Wow. I mean, each to their own. And it, I mean, it's. I should be grateful. I have a tattoo. You guys have tattoos as well. And um, we do have a question actually from Barbara again, um, who's just asked, just out of curios curiosity, do you guys have tattoos and have you experienced the traditional versus modern form? I, I do and I have. Um, and, <laughs> Which do you prefer? Uh, I mean, it's all different, right? You know, it depends mm. on what you want to get. Um, I, I prefer black work. Um, you know, I have, I have modern machine black work. I have uh, traditional hand tap black work. Um, I also then have used myself as a subject for the experimental archeological concerns. Right at a certain point in this process, we've been testing with pig skin, which from a forensic perspective is a good proxy for human skin. But at a certain point, then we had to cross that Rubicon and ask, how do we know that tattooing pig skin and tattooing human skin will leave the same micro wear results? And that was not something that had been specifically studied before. Um, and so I was the subject of my own experiment then to look at that. Um, so I've got kind of a mishmash of things going on. Um, I don't prefer a specific technique, I don't think. Ben, how about you? I have a tattoo of a cabbage. <laughs> I, I'm was a it, vegetable grower. Was, was it done with a cabbage thorn? <laughs> I had to dip a big cabbage stem in ink. And <laughs> no, I, I, I did it myself with an electric machine 30 years ago, 25 years ago. And um, I don't know, I've never been tattooed in the traditional way. I, I tattooed myself with a sewing needle when I was a kid, which can approach traditional methods. I, I had no idea what I was doing and I prefer uh, the result of the electric machine on myself than the one uh, with the sewing needle. But it's very anecdotal evidence. So voila. <laughs> Wow. Um, a couple of people are asking me about my tattoo. Yes, you are correct. This is um, on a mummy. So I've actually worked in Siberia on Scythian, a couple of Scythian Kurgans. Um, and this is more towards uh, the, the border with China. I can never pronounce it. Um, Ukok Plateau. I think it's the correct pronunciation. Yeah, right, guys. Um, you know, <laughs> it's, it's one of those things I always mispronounce. And I'm, I'm very aware of my lack of of this when it comes to anything bar English, like my pronunciation is not great. And it's unfortunate, something that I am trying to improve, but it's, it's quite difficult being a, a, an English speaker. It's, yeah, everybody wants to speak English with me um, when I'm trying to learn a new language and traveling. But um, yep, so this was found on, um, nicknamed Ice, Ice, Ice Maiden Princess. Um, I think around 3,500 3, BCE. I think it's, it's around that time. Is that right? Wait. No, that's Otsi. So more recent that's Otsi, than that. Sorry. It is, yeah. sorry. It's too... What is it now? Oh my goodness. I'm going to have to Google. I'm, I'm it's oldish. It's <laughs> oldish. I think, I think it's like, it's like three, third through fifth centuries BC, I believe. Yeah, because yeah, the, Schist the Schistians anywhere from, yeah, seventh to third. Um, yeah, let's go towards more. It's definitely, yeah, Otsi is so far, as we know. Um, it's currently the oldest, right? Currently. Right. And, and I'm today. sure there'll be some public, yeah, today, <laughs> on the 13th of February, 2021, Otsi is the oldest. So if you're watching That's this right. later, we'll actually put a link in, maybe if whenever it gets published, we'll add it into the description box. Please let us know. All right. We'll add that in. It's, um, it's, you know, disclaimer, it's not our work, but, uh, you know, ears to the ground kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be great. Aaron's such still. an insider. He knows, he knows all the dirt. <laughs> <laughs> it's cool. And this is the thing, like, um, unfortunately, it takes a lot of time to get information out there because, you know, we're, we're looking at it from a scientific point of view, everything that we do as archaeologists, it's a science. So it takes time before we can give it to the public. Um, so that's why. Um, 
let's see. Do, 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 do. Okay, do, do, do. let's see quickly. Right, let's just try two more, two more questions. Oh, this is a great one from Monument Men. Um, hey, uh, they've just got quick question for anyone working with remains. Has anyone had any experience results of using imaging techniques such as decorrelation de stretch or photogrammetry or a combination of both? Absolutely, 100%. Yeah, um, you know, these are not new technologies, but their use on human remains and in archeological settings is pretty new. And um, yeah, actually we, for some research that we are now doing on Andean remains, we have been using um, decorrelation, de-stretch imaging, and also um, infrared. And for those keeping track at home, uh, decorrelation or de-stretch is, a de-stretch was a program that was written for highlighting uh, rock art. And it basically uses a decorrelation algorithm to, very simple stuff, right? Uh, to create kind of a false color space to highlight um, certain marks. And um, here, and I'll actually pull up a, uh, I'll pull up an image while we're talking about it. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm gonna bring up an image here of two tattooed hands from Peru. From Peru. Uh, the one on the left is then imaged at the bottom using infrared. And so you can see how much clearer that becomes that the infrared, the infrared radiation uh, interacts with the carbon and the pigment to, to reflect into the collector. And the hand on the right is uh, not our photo, but is a photo of a tattooed mummy hand that then has been re-imaged using de-stretch, using image decorrelation. And so that just shows you, um, you know, real quickly the way that we can use these technologies to highlight very faint or sometimes even invisible tattoos. This is amazing, actually, when you when you look at it from this point of view. It's, it's fantastic. It's, it, well, it's, and it's, it's this big, I mean, it's almost kind of low-hanging fruit from a research perspective, right? Like there are a lot of preserved remains in world museum collections that someone needs to go back and use new technologies to look at them. And, you know, in the past, people have not set out to look for tattoos in most ancient cultures. They've sort of been found fortuitously or accidentally, um, or they're, you know, they're there on the skin and you can't unsee them once you see them, right? But there needs to be a concerted effort in cultures all around the world to actually deliberately look for these things. Mm. Wow. Okay, so we're gonna have to call it there, um, I'm afraid. I've really enjoyed speaking with both of you today. It's, it's something I've always been fascinated with and I'm sure our viewers at home as well, it's just amazing. Now the link for their book, Ancient Ink, is in the description below. I highly recommend it um, as a starting point. And also you post what, every fortnight, shall we say? Once a week, every fortnight you post on Instagram? You know, whenever. when I when I can pry myself out of the COVID haze to uh, to bother Ben about giving me some something to put on it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, well, you Aaron, Aaron, you know, Archaeology Inc. without Aaron wouldn't exist. Archaeology oh. Inc. without me would be Archaeology Inc. without my advice. <laughs> it would be and far Aaron less accurate. It would be far course. less accurate. <laughs> I just backseat drive like an idiot. Aaron <laughs> does the bulk of the work. I, I, I had to put that out there. Oh, that's brilliant. It's been I an absolute pleasure. Lessons, you know, I love it. It's perfect. <laughs> That's brilliant. To our viewers at home, if you have any questions for them, you can either put in the description uh, in the comments section below or head over to their Instagram, which is they're more active on. But either platform, will, I'll be able to pass the message on to them. So don't worry. Um, thank you all for staying tuned. I'm sorry we have to stop it there, but an hour and 45 minutes, that's, that's, that's a long time. <laughs> but if actually, I think we will say this on live stream, it's such a fascinating, fascinating topic. There's a lot of taboos around tattoos. So during this whole stream, I'm like, wow, we need to make some short educational videos about this. So I think maybe we need to do that. And by saying it live, I have to do it. So I promise okay, right. one. We'll help. <laughs> one video. Yeah, I think we need to get something out there. So that will come soon at some point in the near future. I'm not gonna give a time scale because I don't think I'll stick to it. So. <laughs> It will happen in the first half of this year. We'll make a video. <laughs> Again, 
Um, yeah, but thank you all the viewers at home. Thank you all for your questions. Um, thank you, Charlie, Ashley, Paul, Rocking Bobokin, Monument Men, um, doo -doo -doo, uh, Barbara, What's Up Ukraine, Alex Nyson. Oh, Alex, sorry, I never I said your comment. Hi from Belgium. And they have your book and I highly recommend it. Um, again, really cool to speak to you and hear about your research in the Balkan, um, in the Balkans. That's Ores Stab. Apologies for mis my mispronunciation. Uh, Alex, thank you. Gibson. Um, well, sorry, there's some Russian names. Apologies, you guys know I can't read. But uh, Nini, thank you, Nini. Um, thank you, everyone. Okay, Florida Public Archaeology Network. Thank you, Mark. Ooh. Um, uh, past preservers. Um, okay. I'm losing it. Right. <laughs> Thank Thanks, Tosh. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We really appreciate Thank it. You a lot. Okay. Bye, guys. See you Bye. all next week. Okay, we're offline. All right. <laughs>